Welcome to the JD Power Travel Podcast. I'm Michael Vermillion with JD Power, and with me today are Mike Taylor, who leads our travel practice, Jenny Corwin, our lead analyst for travel, uh, Andrea Stokes, our practice leader for hospitality. So, Mike and Jenny and Andrea, welcome. Hello. 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 All right. Great. Uh, so, Mike, first topic. Uh, CES, always a big uh, newsmaker in uh, January uh, every year. Uh, and we saw, I think, this year for maybe the first time, a big presence uh, by both Delta Airlines and also Enterprise. So I guess the question is, uh, CES turning into a travel show? <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah, I think that Delta, and especially Delta, you know, took to heart that they should, uh, you know, go go big or stay home from CES. So they announced a lot of interesting stuff. And, and as I've said before in this podcast, it seems like the the travel world is is moving towards the model that we see in Tom Cruise and Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. And uh, Delta certainly seems to want to deliver on that. Uh, some of their announcements had to do with robotics, uh, actually personal robotics. But the biggest things that that, that are probably more uh, it on the near horizon is a partnership with Lyft. Uh, I think Delta takes to heart that they want to be a transportation company and not just uh, the, the part that where you get on the actual aircraft or get off the aircraft. So they're looking for that intermodal uh, connectivity with their passengers to kind of capture uh, that experience from one end to the other. And pursuant to that, um, they've adopted this model that they're going to try to introduce in the, over the next several years that, uh, you know, the in-flight entertainment just doesn't apply to the in-flight part of your travel experience. They're hoping that by the time that you check in on your Delta app, then you might start watching a movie or streaming a, you know, uh, the, the detectorists or something, and then uh, start watching it through the Delta app, and then maybe watch it at the gate, and then continue it on the flight, uh, and pause it whenever you want, and finish it up whenever you want, so that you kind of have a, a better connection to uh, the experience of actually getting to the airport, waiting for the aircraft, getting on the aircraft, you know, obviously uh, going through the entire flight process and being entertained. Uh, because it's, it's shown in our data, in the J.D. Power data of uh, North American Airlines, that when people are entertained, and this includes in the airport and on the aircraft, they have a lot more positive feelings about the entire experience, including, you know, how nice the people are that uh, service you while you're uh, on the aircraft, how clean the lavatory facilities might be on the aircraft and things like that. And basically, it's just taking your mind off of, you know, what would be otherwise a rather boring experience. And Delta uh, says that they've grown the, the number of people working on these projects to about 300, which is a significant investment for Delta. And on the enterprise side of things, um, they're, again, putting a big toe into the water for connected vehicles, you know, which uh, is something that works to the advantage of the person who's renting the car, that they are kind of a, a bespoke experience about, you know, oh, you need to return your car right, to catch your 3 p.m. flight from LAX, and given the traffic conditions, you need to leave now from where your car is located, uh, all the way to helping enterprise manage their fleet of where these people are going, who might be extending their rental, when they might be extending it, and doing a little bit of forecasting. And both these companies are applying artificial intelligence and huge data set uh, analyses to predict people's behavior. So, you know, that, that those are the two are the, the many initiatives announced by those two companies at CES this past month. Thanks, Mike. It's a uh, kind of a great way to kick off the year with all that uh, news and all those new things to uh, to think about. So, Andrea, turning to uh, hospitality, uh, last year uh, towards the end of the year, we saw kind of a downturn in terms of. Um, uh, occupancy and and um, and rate growth and that kind of thing and and now we're starting to see some forecasts for 2020 in terms of where uh, rate growth is going for uh, for hotels uh, and it's it's not looking promising right based on uh, on everything we're seeing. That's correct. That's correct. So uh, Smith Travel Research um, has uh, you know released its 2020 forecast. Um, and uh, some interesting, you know, um, fundamentals in place. ADR growth uh, has been negative for six quarters in a row, actually. Uh, and, um, you know, there's kind of a lot going on in terms of 
what is is putting downward pressure on room rates uh, in in 2020. So I think some of these fundamentals again are continuing, but um, you know a couple of the big um, impacts are price transparency, of course, continued transparency and uh, the way that the distribution channels are uh, working with the chains um, on on room rates, displaying room rates, which room rates are being displayed when, uh, you know, of course, that's going to continue. Um, also, you know, of course, the new supply on the market uh, is not um, – at the high end, so seven out of ten rooms being built right now are in upscale or upper mid scale in the upscale upper mid scale categories. So um, that's where the focus is, right? And in and in many markets, there's of course a lot of competition uh, in those categories. So also putting downward pressure on uh, room rates. Um, the occupancy picture doesn't help either. So, um, you know, in high supply markets and saturated markets, occupancy has been going down as well in 2019, and that's predicted to continue uh, in 2020. So, I, you know, I think overall for hoteliers, it will be challenging. Uh, it will be a challenging year, um, you know, in some cases, you know, a lot of these brand new properties uh, are able to charge lower rates than older properties. So I think it will be a challenge for, you know, uh, hoteliers with, you know, perhaps aging uh, buildings and aging properties to um, invest, uh, you know, and really, really kind of figure out uh, the landscape in terms of how um, how they can compete. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's a great, uh, great overview, and um, we look forward to uh, working with the industry to to to, to get through this uh, challenging year that's coming up. So, Mike, turning back to uh, to airports, uh, the uh, the big news most recently it's uh, really run Denver and Denver's expansion and and adding gates, and uh, that's got some implications for a couple of the airlines as well. So, so what's what's happening out there? Well, basically, Denver has been growing at a, a nice clip. They haven't slowed down at all in the last five years. I think this past year they were up seven uh, percent in traffic volume, on a fairly high base, uh, somewhere around sixty million passengers or so. Um, so Denver, of course, uh, is it's about forty-five, fifty percent United, about twenty-five percent Southwest, and actually it's one of the bigger Frontier airports. I think Frontier is about ten percent of the traffic out there. Um, so, but Denver, I would assume what United is trying to, to do is take over the planned expansion that's already on the books uh, and taking over an awful lot of gates that are being built in this coming year and then asking Denver or committing to Denver that they want even more gates. And the issue here comes about, you know, as we look at the things that people in the, in the, in that respond to our uh, North American airport study, you know, the number one factor uh, for satisfaction is people's reaction to the building itself, the terminal facilities. Uh, and one of those things has to do with a comfort, which involves you know, how many seats are available. And if you're growing at 7% per year, that means an awful lot of people are taking up those seats. And then when you run out of seats, your air, airport becomes much less comfortable for the traveler. Um, but the other part of it is actual terminal design. And what Denver at least has on the books to do right now is just simply extend the length of the buildings which is the easiest thing to do architecturally and operationally. Um, however, it's probably the, it's, that's really compromises satisfaction with the airport building itself. You are causing people at those far gates to walk uh, a tremendous amount. And, you know, if you look at, say, for example, Detroit Metro, which wins our study, by the way, for mega airports, it's a mile long building. Uh, the new extension uh, for Delta at Terminal 4 at JFK is over three quarters of a mile long building and it's it you're only enter you enter at one end and walk almost the entire length if you're at the far gates and it always seems like i'm at those far gates too by the way because that's i fly out of J, jfk quite a bit so uh you know we would advise at jd power that that airports take a little bit more time to design around their passengers and not just take the easiest route out 
that might be the cheapest route to go and the most, uh, you know, uh, has the shortest frame for building new gates at the airport. Simply adding onto the building is probably a, a compromise they may not want to make with their passengers. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I think it, it helps in Detroit because they put a train inside the building, right? So uh, to get yes, it does. It does help, <laughs> but but that has a draw. Has another drawback. You know, if yeah. you're on that train, you're going past all this great food, beverage, and retail that you could be spending money at. So yeah, you know, it's a, it, that is a compromise as well. That's true. So hey, so Jenny, uh, last topic on digital. Uh, we saw a recent announcement uh, with the uh, Hyatt partnering uh, with an app called Headspace. Uh, to offer well-being content to guests and employees, uh, and I, I believe that this uh, either this app or one of their competitors has already partnered with the airlines as well. So, is this uh, what's what's um, what's going on here? What's what's Hyatt's thinking behind this, and is this something we're going to continue to see over time? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting, and I know Hyatt for years has been you know they really tout their focus on wellness um, most. Most hotel brands do have a at least one or two wellness focused brands, but um, you know as wellness becomes more and more of a trend, I think um, the idea of guided meditation and also focusing on sleep when you're traveling, right, which is something we focused on in our uh, most recent hotel study, the importance of a good night's sleep and, and satisfaction, uh, um, and hotels are really picking up on that, right? It's important to make uh, guests feel like they're at home and to help them. You know, travel causes a lot of anxiety. So I think these are apps that you'll see um, taking off as something that they can offer as a way to really create an experience um, that's a little bit uh, more curated, more custom, um, and really focused on on guest well-being. And, and seeing it in airlines makes a lot of sense, right? Um, that I don't think there's anything more anxiety-inducing within travel than the air travel experience. Channeling my inner Mike Taylor there, I think I've heard him say that once or twice. Um, and so having um, guided meditation as part of your in-flight entertainment can really help some of those guests who may be nervous flyers or who just may be anxious from the stresses of, of frequent travel. So I, I think this is something we could see um, as a very effective way uh, to improve guest and passenger experiences um, by really just kind of improving their overall well-being and health if they choose to use it. Okay, thanks very much, Jenny. Uh, so that's going to be a wrap for our first podcast of, uh, of the year. Uh, Mike, Jenny, and Andrea, thanks so much for joining us today. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And thanks to our listeners for joining as well. To learn more about the J.D. Power Travel practice, please follow us on LinkedIn. You'll find us in the showcase section under J.D. Power Travel and Hospitality. Uh, or you can visit us on the web at jdpower.com business. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>